At 18 years old, I bought my first house for $135,000. I have six months to fully renovate both inside and out before my college roommates move in. Later in this video, I'll give a complete cost breakdown and how I was able to afford this property. This 1100 square foot house includes three bed, one and a half bath with a detached two car garage. From the title and thumbnail, the first question probably going through your mind is, how did I have enough money to buy a house at 18 years old? In 2017, I started a YouTube channel. I was a junior in high school when I started it. That first year in 2017, I made $17,000. Then the following year, my senior year, when I was 18, I took it a little more serious and made a total of $53,000. Now all those numbers are before tax as well and any living expenses and all that stuff. But I was living with my parents so I could save pretty much all of that money. To pay for the house, I got a loan of $105,000, put $30,000 down from my savings. A 30 year term at 4% comes out to $500 a month on the mortgage payment. Now add insurance and real estate tax, our monthly payment comes to $850. And here's a tour of the interior. It needs some work. The kitchen had a weird pink wallpaper. Half of the cabinets were stuck shut. The countertops were busted, cracked, and really uneven. Walking out of the kitchen, you go straight into the living room. And throughout the house, there's original hardwood flooring. Especially in the living room, it's in rough shape. And it looks like at one time, they had carpet over about half of it. The windows were single pane. They leaked a lot of air. And about half of them, I never actually got to open up. On the main floor, there's also a small bedroom connected to the half bath. Now walking upstairs, there's a full bathroom with tub shower combo. This floor has two bedrooms, including the master. The driveway is shared and on my side, the retaining wall is falling down. So the plan is excavate out the whole retaining wall, scooch it back and widen the driveway. Thankfully, Grant, my brother recorded it back then to post on his channel. As a freshman in college, I was still driving around my high school car, a 1999 Cadillac SLS, which cost a thousand dollars and had a leaking head gasket. So I was very fortunate to be able to use my dad's 97 Ford F-250. Being able to borrow the truck and all that equipment really helped me save on expenses and time. Now we'll shoot forward into the summer where we started the retaining wall project. First thing to do is get all the old block out and debris. With most of it falling over in the drive, it wasn't too difficult. Now I have terrible before and after pictures and they just don't do it justice on how tight the driveway actually was. Every time I pulled into the drive, I was so nervous I was gonna scratch the side of the car. And if I was gonna rent the house out in the future, this driveway had to be fixed. Watch out, other one. So we got a lot of weight on here. This is why we got diesel. So we probably got to take out some more steps yet. Just all this is done so far. This is the line where everything's going. So we got to take away all this dirt. This dirt, you guys see right here, we gotta take all this out yet, but that's some good dirt. So what we're gonna try to do is, is use some of that to like level off the back of his yard because we didn't realize how much dirt there actually is. And who knows if this is gonna dump, it'll be interesting. Cause last time it struggled with the concrete, we got a lot more weight up front. <laughs> yep. Didn't come out the best, but at least we got it out. So it's now day two of working on the project. But now today, Spencer and dad went at 7 a.m. to grab the stump grinder and they're just destroying these stumps. The blade's a little dull, so you hear it like, it, it's taking them a lot longer. Earlier off camera, I took the chainsaw to this spot and removed brush and small trees. The red spray paint marks the underground power line, which we need to be careful of on this project. After working the stumps down, we put some fabric in and turned it into a parking spot with gravel. Now being less than a mile away from campus, students drive to this neighborhood to park and walk to class. The street parking is well enforced as I later on learned, so having proper parking really pays. We got a thin layer, just a couple more spots to fill around here. Spence, how is she? Was it too bad? Yesterday we grinded a bunch of stumps. Lots of work over there still. 
So what did it cost you total for this? 80, 70, 80. Another load, ready to haul. Last time I loaded it way too heavy. This time I loaded it a lot more in the back. All right, boys, we got Farmer Grant in the tractor clearing the spot for more dirt to come. He's enjoying himself quite a bit, as you can tell. So we are in a rush right now. Those are not mine. To get to Spencer's. So this is like part two of the whole build, I guess, the landscaping build that we're working on. What ended up happening is we got three days worth of three days worth of stuff done, and then Spencer and Dad just had like, hey, let's get the roof done. My brother and I had never done any roof work before that, and it was slow going at first. With the house roof getting replaced, we thought we might as well knock the garage out as well. Underneath the shingles, the boards were all in good shape, nothing was rotted, so all we had to do was replace the shingles. After a few learning mistakes, we got her finished up and squared away. What we gotta do is we have all the shingles, the old shingles that we ripped off, we just tore them off the top and then tossed them in the dump trailer. Me and Spencer have today, have to go dump. They're all soaking wet. Good! So we just got done dropping off the shingles so we can just focus on uh, the landscaping wall. So me and Spencer are now just starting to clean up. We got all of this taken out. There was a lot of dirt. We just got this all taken out through here. He's spinning. Four wheel drive, baby. Come on. You're better than that squad. Question is, will the hydraulic power be able to lift? Questionably, how many tons? Yeah. Woo. That was close. That was real close. So we're greasing this because I don't think we've ever greased this before even. You guys are probably wondering why we are renting a machine for the day that's such a waste of money when we already own one and yeah now that i think about it it kind of is but grant ended up convincing me to rent this thing it kind of came in handy when we jumped into the trench there and got a good nice level scoop it did grade a bit better too so when we were slicking up the yard and leveling out some spots that came in handy so i'm not sure what day it is it could be like day eight of this project but first this was completely level there's about between four to six inches all throughout here that we took out. But before it was level, it was hard clay, and so we couldn't get in there. This, our big skid loader wouldn't fit down there. Now here's some good pictures showing exactly how much dirt we ended up excavating out. A few things we had to be careful of to not mess with was the AC unit. We didn't want to disturb that foundation too much and have to move it. But also we had to make enough room for the retaining wall and make the whole project worthwhile. And this is what it looked like after getting some forms up a couple inches layer of gravel and now we are ready for concrete so right now we're waiting to pour cement got cory hello cory's helping starting all the way down here and i'm working all the way through there So we got it done. It's all brushed off, but it made a little edging. And then next is just gonna be retaining walls all the way down this, a retaining wall, a retaining brick. Now here's a good shot to see actually how much wider we're making the driveway. After the concrete dried, I came in with a saw and made the cut lines. Now we need some good base gravel to put as the foundation of our retaining wall. So a little change of plans. It seems like everybody's always like changing times and like we're, Spencer doesn't live here right now. So like we're never here and it's like a 30 minute drive up here. They called, we were supposed to get pavers and me and Spencer were supposed to, to get started on this tomorrow, getting all the pavers done. They called and they're like, oh, it's gonna be Saturday. Right now it's Thursday. Uh, and so we had all planned out for Thursday to just work all day on this. And so the base takes forever. And all we're gonna need is like three pallets to start the base. So what I'm gonna do, we're gonna drive down there. It's like a 50 minute drive down there, get the pallet. So we got all three of these loaded up. These are heavy, actually. This middle one we might have to do by hand. So right now, we are completely stranded. The Ford let us down. No, I'm joking. That would never the happen. The trailer let us down, boys. Go flat. She got shredded.
In the end, us trying to save a day by going and getting a load ourselves was a wash due to the flat tire. And the funniest thing was watching this forklift driver unload the pallet. I mean, every turn he was skidding the tires, slamming on the brakes. Let's just take a minute and watch. Day one of lane bricks, pavers, whatever you want to call them. We're done. Probably took five to six hours. One hour with two guys because I wasn't there and the last five hours with me. Just because you had to get this perfectly level because we're going to stack this like three or four tall. So now we're on to the next day. I felt the hardest part about this build was designing and installing the steps to have them tie into the wall and just getting all your measurements right. And we had to make sure there was really good compaction on these steps because this is really the only part of the wall that you're going to be stepping on. And if settling happens, you're going to notice it right away. In the left of this shot, you can see a red handle thingy sticking out of the blocks. That was the most efficient tool ever. And it turned these 90 pound blocks into pretty much five gallon pail buckets. And you could have two handles in one and walk up and down the the driveway no problem really easy to move first layer took the same amount of time as all the other layers combined we really took our time making sure it was compact level foundation that way the whole entire wall all the way up is good to go once you're on a long run you can really start flying and lay down a lot of blocks one guy takes the blocks from the pallet sets it on the wall another comes with two pins that slide into the block there's preset holes already made we came with three quarter inch clean rock to backfill we had a drainage pipe perforated pipe below this covered in a sock so all through here is completely done. The stairs took us forever to design, so we're fishing up that. And this will have all tops. It'll look a lot better than this. So it's the final day. I guess if you want to call it the final day. And the retaining wall is completely done. This feels so good. I guess there's one thing. We have to glue the steps. Just glue the tops, the caps of the steps. For those of you who have already caught this in an earlier clip, this is probably the most annoying and worst spot to make a mistake. The driveway slopes uphill when you're standing at the bottom towards the street. And every time you want to start going uphill and you don't want to keep cutting into the ground, you need to step up one block. And for some dumb reason, I was like, oh, we'll just step up half a block well what that does is you don't tie in your lines in i don't know how i didn't catch this earlier we caught it when i was gluing on the caps of the wall and i was not going to go back and fix it i probably should have but at the time it took quite a few more days than i ever thought it would i think we built the wall totally overkill and especially in this spot it's not even hip high i don't think there's going to be any issues with this wall falling over the foundation is very deep i think it just looks terrible for those who know what they're looking at 34b 83 block Okay, we're good. We Everything's good. strapped down. Let's get going before we blow a tire again, we dude. Need. And now it's time to get to work on the interior. I closed and took possession of the home February 28th, 2019. That gives me six months to get all major renovation done in time for August 1st move-in day. The major things on my to-do list are to fully redo the kitchen, sand and refinish the hardwood floors throughout, a new half bath, and retexture walls and fresh paint. I planned on hiring out a new roof and gutters, all windows on the home, and any electrical work done. And we'll start with the kitchen. I started off by getting rid of the appliances, sold them for $200, Peeled off the ugly pink wallpaper that was actually on there pretty good. The laminate flooring came up, baseboards, all that kind of stuff. The plaster wall where the old cabinets were and a little bit of the backsplash kind of came off with it. So that was tough and I had to patch it. I went with the paint color agreeable gray. I thought it would match the kitchen design that I picked out. And to pick out the kitchen, I pretty much walked into Menards, saw whatever display looked the best to me and bought it. It was clear view cabinetry. It was like 2000, 2200 bucks. And then I went with all stainless steel appliances as well. After watching some YouTube videos and a helping hand from my dad, we got all the cabinets hung up. We installed all the doors and the countertop went on. And this is what it looked like when it was all complete. I tried to go with the clean modern look here. There's a lot of gray in here. Some people say that's boring, but I like it, especially if you're going to come in here and redo everything. I learned a bunch on this project, especially. And I think this was the biggest single improvement to the interior of the home. And in my opinion, it turned out great. Now onto the hardwood floor. 
floors. We'll be turning this rough, ugly stained wood into a nice, smooth, darker glass finish. I rented the sanders from the store and went through a couple hundred bucks worth of sandpaper. Now, it took a bit of technique and a lot of YouTube videos to get this drum sander down properly. You wanted to make sure as you were going, it was kind of like mowing the lawn, but if you ever stopped and that drum was on the ground, you're essentially digging a hole into the wood and you're going to feel it forever. And for the upstairs, I think the sander must have got out of balance or just messed up and it left kind of distinct lines in the floor and I could never get them out. After the drum sander, I'd come back with a smaller sander to get all the way up to the boards, get all the edges. Going up and down the stairs was pretty tricky. Sometimes I had to use a Dremel on little tiny spots or just like a hand piece of sandpaper. I forget what the stain was called, but I was trying to get a little darker finish. I didn't want to go crazy dark, but I didn't want the whiteness of just like what a sanded floor and a natural looking floor looked because there were still stains in the floor and it seemed like they were very prominent when it was a lighter wood. So we got her stained, let it dry, put a couple coats of polyurethane on, and I think it turned out pretty good. Like I said, you can still see those lines and scratches. I don't know. It's probably my fault, but in the end, everything looks better, especially the living room where all the traffic was. And my favorite part, you can put nice new socks on and slide across the floor really good. And it's just so much more durable with the thick polyurethane coating. I'm happy with the idea of restoring these, not just putting carpet over it or something. It kind of kept the charm of the house, the old feeling. And whenever we wanted a little bit of carpet, we just put rugs down. Now the full bath compared to other areas in the house was in pretty good condition. And I wanted to leave it mostly untouched. After running the shower, I discovered the leak in the plumbing behind the wall. And once I ripped this around out, there was a lot of rotten and dry wood and some two by fours. My guess was that we had a really cold spell that past winter where it got negative 20, negative 30 degrees and it busted the pipe. So I repacked it with better insulation, put a new surround in and drywall, added some finishing pieces to give it a nice fresh look. Throughout the house, I retextured the walls and ceiling with knockdown and orange peel. And then in the bathroom, I painted it mostly white and also the sink, I painted that white. I liked how the bathroom turned out and it was pretty cheap to do. The downstairs half bath was unique in how tiny it was in that it connected the kitchen and downstairs bedroom together. The toilet and sink were leaking with some damage to the flooring. So this called for a total redo. I went with ceramic tile to tie the kitchen together, bought the smallest toilet and sink vanity I could find, a new mirror and light, and this is how it turned out. The bath was still tiny. I didn't do anything about that, but at least it looked good now. Now on the outside, I didn't do all the work myself and hired out replacing the windows with dual pane double hung windows to keep the previous style the same. You'd pop the old ones out, slide the new ones in, and then they would come back later with a painted metal trim over the old blue wood. And the only real issue I had working with contractors was this window company. Spencer has been just getting utterly screwed over. They said it was going to be a day and a half to get the windows installed, and right now it's been, I think, 30 days. They started day one, dude's Duramax broke down halfway, took him like three hours, came up with tons of excuses. Then he got here and it was like only one guy. So my dad and my brother were helping him all day, just replace out the windows, like just basically workers for him. And then they like had to get other worker installs cause that guy, like he didn't even have a truck anymore and stuff. Cause it's kind of all subcontracted out. But it's pretty crazy what's happening. Spencer's definitely learned a lot throughout like this whole house flip. And in the end, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was more a three day job that they promised turning into two, two and a half months. And at one point, my my dad and I even ripped out about half the windows, so that was a good experience. There's a lot of bad communication by the company, and I was left in the dark for weeks on end. At one point, I was deciding whether to just go to Home Depot, buy new windows, and we would replace it ourselves before we had to move in. In the end, all windows turned out fine, and they worked good. The roof and gutters ended up getting replaced thanks to my insurance guy finding a claim was taken out on the home by the previous owner for some tree damage. They pocketed the money and never fixed that damaged area, so we were able to negotiate 5000 into the purchase agreement as a credit on the roof. So in the end, I only had to pay 3000 out of my pocket to get absolutely everything replaced, shingles and gutters. Now the house is finished, move in ready. Here's some before and after pictures.
We moved into the house that fall to start our second year of college. Here are some funny home videos. <laughs> Nominated by my girl Patricia. Uh. <laughs> the first soldier to get wounded was Alan. We have a really big hill by the house. He decided to bomb down the hill on his skateboard, got some speed wobble at the end, and absolutely slammed. His battle scars was a chipped tooth and dislocated shoulder. We've been in the house for about six months now. It's the following spring and I have some outside projects I want to do. Here's Spencer's new Ranger. He's got the BF Goodrich tires, which is an all-terrain tire. Gosh dang, good American right there, Ford Ranger. The Caddy started to overheat. I traded it in for 500 bucks and bought this 2011 Ford Ranger. It only had like 80,000 miles on it. Got it for six grand. Me and Spence are going the next day and we ran a skid loader. What happened was we were, gonna, we were planning to use the dump trailer, which would save us a hundred bucks, but the dump trailer didn't fit the Harley rake in it. So we had to cough up the hard bucks and then use their trailer, which worked out good. Now we're about three quarters of the way done. We're getting there. So far, we got everything graded and then we got the little side bank grass cleaned up as best we could. It was so like humpy. Those both go up. Dude, I love this thing. This is like a kid in a candy store, man. Grant liked that rental machine so much, a year later my dad sold his John Deere skid loader and Grant bought a track Kubota. The skid steer you see in my past videos. What'd you get here, Spencer? Uh, Ryan, my buddy here. He, uh, he's got four wheels and 10 horsepower. He's a good man. We got his yard completely done. We laid down some straw bales to help grass get started. I broadcasted and used an overseeder. That worked really good. Now I wish I went with a shadier mix of seed because I underestimated how much sunlight was going to be choked out by the mature trees. But in the end, it turned out great and was nice to mow with the ground being so smooth now. Once the grass grew and got established, we had an open weekend and decided to put a fire pit in the yard. It was a good little spot for it out of the way and we kind of indented it into the grass. So it looked really clean and turned out good. That was the last major project on the house and everything else would just just be a little fix up and repairs. So I'm gonna to be totally transparent and show you the numbers, how I got savings to make that down payment. In 2017, I started a YouTube channel and essentially what I do on this channel is play a game called Farming Simulator. So I make YouTube videos playing this game, talking over it, voicing over it, and then I post them on YouTube and you can make money off that. I was a junior in high school when I started it. That first year in 2017, I made $17,000. Then the following year, my senior year, when I was 18, I took it a little more serious and made a total of $53,000 in 2018. 
2018. Now all those numbers are before tax as well and any living expenses and all that stuff. But I was living with my parents so I could save pretty much all of that money. Now to fast forward, I'm a freshman in college. I graduated high school and I have some savings built up and I'm trying to figure out what should I do with that? I was studying economics and finance kind of purely as a passion for the subject, not to go a certain career path, not even to get like a corporate job, finance job, any of that. And at the time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I kind of always knew I wanted to work for myself. So the winter of 2018, 2019, my freshman year while I was in the dorms, that right there is the dorms I was living in. I started doing some house shopping. I was just kind of toying with the idea. Somehow take my savings, invest it into a house, fix it up. And that's kind of my internship while I'm still doing the YouTube channel the side. There was a public listing that I liked, a three bedroom, one and a half bath house. It was listed for like $175,000. And then over the winter months, they started to drop the price. It went from 175 to 170, then it all went all the way down to 160. And when it did that, I put an offer in, a lowball offer for 120 grand. And after some negotiations, I bought it for $135,000. And so because I started my YouTube business in 2017, I only had two years of taxable income at that time, and I needed another six months until I could get a commercial loan. Now if I had a W-2 job, I could just show how much money that's gonna pay me in the year, and you can get a commercial loan pretty easy. But since I filed 1099, I'm self-employed, I had to have three years of taxable income to even get approved for anything. And so I found a private money lender and I borrowed $100,000 from them at 4%. Now keep in mind, interest rates were lower back then. And so I'd borrow that money for about six months is the plan. And then I would be able to be approved for a commercial loan after that. Now with the renovation done, we can see how much everything costs. The total bill came in at $35,000. Roof and gutters was $8,000. Windows came in at $7,000. Plumbing, electrical work. I had a lot of light fixtures that came in. That was $3,000. The retaining wall, we did a lot of the labor ourselves, but all the blocks, the gravel, and a few equipment costs came in at $6,000. The kitchen was $5,000, that's cabinets, all the appliances and everything and flooring. The hardwood floors, the paint and all the texturing I did on the walls that came in at $1,500 for all those little supplies, they add up quick. And then for all miscellaneous items, I totaled that to $5,000. So I bought the house for $135,000. Then the renovation costs came to 35K. Add those together, you get $170,000. Now going into this, I thought the house would be worth around 180 to 190,000 if market conditions stayed the same after my renovations. I rented the two rooms out to my buddies, Parker, and Allen for 500 a piece. Now I had to pay for all utilities. That was somewhere around 200, 250 bucks. Scenario A is when I was living in the home and renting out the two bedrooms. Scenario B is when I moved out. I graduated college early and rented out all three bedrooms. Each room's rented out $500. There's the difference. And that was gonna be our gross monthly income. Now looking at repairs and maintenance, I set aside $2,000 a year or $83 a month for that. Our property taxes were 225 bucks a month. Property insurance came to 45 bucks a month. And then this was $50 a month just for more capex now when i was living there i covered all utilities about 150 dollars a month and when i wasn't the renters did scenario a we're gonna have 150 dollars more expense due to the utilities here's our annual incomes then our annual expenses and our net operating income now our purchase price was 135 bucks that comes out to a cap rate of four percent or close to ten percent if i rented out the whole entire place here's all our loan information and cash out of pocket was about thirty thousand dollars after a thirty five thousand dollar renovation cost so our cash in the house turned to 67,000. Our most important number is cash flow. I got to live there for $54 a month or $655 a year. In scenario B, if I rented out the whole entire house, we were cash flowing about 600 bucks a month or seven grand a year. And five years later, this is how it actually played out. Scenario A took place for 19 months where I was living in the home. We're negative $54, so that comes to $1,037 negative. But then I moved out and scenario B took place where I rented the whole entire home. At $600 a month, that comes out for 12 months at $7,100 or profit of $6,100 on rental income. But going into it, I thought I was going to own this house kind of for the rest of my life. And if I'm going to go in there and renovate it, don't do kind of a half job. Go in there, do everything right, everything you'd want to do that 20 years from now you'd be happy you did it. But as time went on, my feelings kind of changed towards the house. I felt like I didn't want to own it forever so 2022 at the time felt like a really good time to sell a house again our all-in cost is 170,000 and I talked with the realtor we decided to list it for a $220,000 at the time we got eight offers all were above asking or what I was asking for it and then three of them were cash and so I chose the highest offer that was cash $251,500 is what I sold it for this is what the house sale looked like on paper again our total cash invested was 67,000 between the rehab cost and down payment 
Still owed $100,000 on the home, so our break-even cost is there. Sold it for $251,500. Our net rental income, what we took home after all expenses and everything in our pocket. Our net profit comes out to about $75,000 on the sale. And that includes all the closing costs, realtor fees associated with that. But that's how it all panned out. It's 2024. We're looking back now. It was a good decision. Should I have held it more? Maybe I should have kept it in 2022 before interest rates kind of started to run up and I should have refinanced it. I mean, maybe Maybe I'll look back and think that way. Currently, right now, I'm totally happy with the sell. And one thing, too, going into this is if I was going to own that home forever, I would probably buy more rental properties, you know, buy one every like three years or something and start really building it up. And so I didn't want to do that and we got it sold. So that's the story of the house. It was a lot of work, learned a ton, made a bunch of mistakes, too. Hopefully, you can learn from me. I can learn from some of the comments. If you have like more in depth questions, happy to answer them in the comment section. Thanks for watching, guys. This was fun and hopefully, you enjoyed.